Good evening, class. Uh, we welcome you from wherever you are watching tonight. And uh, we're so glad you could join us. And if you have been joining us for the last several weeks, you know where we are. Uh, we are on page six, and we are in Romans chapter 12. And we have been working our way for some time, a long time, through the book of Romans. And I am in the midst of praying about where we're going after Romans, but I'm about 95% sure where we're going after this. Um, so we are now at the 19th verse. We just last week started the 19th verse. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, if you will turn to Romans, the 12th chapter, and the 19th verse. And while you are turning there, if you would like to send a prayer request, we do seriously pray over your prayer request. If you have a question that you would like answered, we will answer it. If you have a comment uh, about something we have taught, if you would like to comment on it, we appreciate the comments. I will share them. Um, please, you can do that by writing in uh, to the church address. If you would like to give in response to the teaching that you receive, according to Galatians 6.6, 6, you may do that. And, um, and you can do that the same way. You can either send it in or you can drop it off. If you're local, drop it off in the drop box in the lobby of the church, that's fine. And tonight I'd like to give a shout out to someone who is just so faithful in writing in all the time. And uh, that's um, uh, Susan, to Sister Susan, we give a shout out to you. Thank you for your faithfulness. And thank you for being a remote member of our class every week. And um, just give little Bobby a hug for us. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's her little pet. So, thank you, Susan. So by now, you should be on page six. You should have your Bible open to Romans 12, looking at verse 19. And we are, I'm going to read the 19th verse in case this you just happen to tune in or you happen to find it on the internet. So verse 19 of the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, which starts the actual application of the doctrinal portion of Romans we have covered in chapters 1 through 11. So it said, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So, we are on note 36. It says, give place to wrath. So, that is dote, give, topon, place, te, or gay, wrath. So, in other words, what this is saying when it says, okay, uh, give place to wrath. What it means is let your wrath have time to calm down. How many ever grew up and maybe your parents or your teachers told you, before you say anything, before you act, stop and count to ten? Well, why, why did they, because to let let you have time before you do or say something that you will regret. And understand something, we live in a volatile society right now. Amen. I mean, it is unbelievable. I mean, I mean, I mean road rage. When I was first learning to drive, which I admit was probably a little after the flood, um, you know, there was no such thing as road rage. No. No, I, and I admit, I grew up in a little town. 
But, you know, you came up to stop and there were other cars that they'd go, and you did that, that was fine. And you didn't have, uh, there was no such thing as road rage. But do you know how many literal killings take place on the road over stupidness? Stupidness, thank you. Cut offs, you're not going fast enough. Have you ever been out and, you're, and you can't go because the car ahead of you is not going fast, and so the person behind you gets so close you think they're coming up over you. That happened to me just Sunday night. I said, okay already, I cannot go anywhere, but just so angry. And then as soon as you got a chance, whoom, around, I thought, okay. Just little things like that. Killing people over the slightest little thing. So this is saying, listen, everybody has the capacity of getting angry. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the capacity to what? Have wrath. Mm -hmm. But it says, let your wrath have time to calm down. And if we are believers, then the believer should refrain from avenging oneself in order to allow to take place the justice which God will exercise. Listen, by the way, are we all perfect in doing that? No. Sometimes we get so frustrated, and I understand that. It just means, hey, we all have to remind ourselves to do that. And you may judge a person one time, and they may be able to judge you the next time. So it's not a matter of judging or saying, hey, we all need to calm down. Yeah, we all need to calm down. And we all need to give ourselves room. But understand, it should be what? It should be our goal. Knowing what? What if you can't do it yourself? Do we have, do we have help? Yes. Ask the Lord to help us. So, but the one thing we should do is refrain from avenging oneself. And, and when that happens, we are allowing to take place the justice which God will exercise. And here's the key. A lot of times, you want, we all want to help God out. Is there anyone that sometimes would really like to help God out? Thank, thank you. Two honest people raise their hands. Yes. But God's going to exercise his justice when and how he thinks good when and how he thinks good. And sometimes it's not as quickly as we like it, but when he does it, it's complete. Now, wrath is uh, the Greek orge, and uh, by the way, orge, and that's why, how many know that sometimes we can get angry quickly and then as quickly it comes down? That's not what this is referring to. So if you're inclined to judge somebody, say, oh, I know this person has wrath. No. I want you to look at this word. This does not, orge does not refer to uncontrollable anger to which human beings are prone. Up quickly and, oh, I don't like this, they're doing this. No. Please hear me. Orge uh, refers to God's settled indignation and controlled, controlled, passionate, hostile feeling towards sin in all its manifestations. So it's a settled uh, indignation. Now, it is written, it is written. How many know that, that when that is said, it refers to what? That what God has said, and it's written in the word, and it's, that's it. And so, is speaking of the Word of God, 
Now, the Word of God carries great authority, A-U-T-H-O-R-I-T-Y, great authority for the faith. That's our, by the way, this is our authority. And this is the authority. It's not what I think. It's not what I think should be. It's what the Word of God declares. And today in my own devotional time, I was just thinking of this, and I, and I, and I may just kind of throw this out. Recently, <coughs> in a staff meeting, we were um, talking about, uh, we're, it started out by asking different staff people, what is your favorite restaurant and why? And then it went on to this discussion. Do you know that some people choose churches the way they choose restaurants? Now hang with me for a minute, why I'm saying that. Well, uh, they just say the things I want to hear. It makes me feel good. And, and I don't like those other churches, you know. They're, 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 they're too strict to follow the word of God, or they're too this, or they're too that. I have seen people seriously leave churches because pastors talked the full counsel of God's word, all of all of God's word. And I know people. They say, well, I just don't want to hear that. And, and I understand why certain people don't want to hear that. Because they hit too, too close to home and I don't want to listen to that, so I'm going to go to a church that, where they aren't going to say that and I don't have to deal with that. And I think it was 2000, I think it was nine, I uh, had occasion. Uh, we had occasion to see the uh, original copy of the Jeffersonian Bible. How many have ever heard of the Jeffersonian Bible? We actually saw one of the original editions of the Jeffersonian Bible. How many know what the Jeffersonian Bible is? Okay, it is a Bible. Can you imagine someone someone having the audacity to say, "I'm going to edit the Bible." <laughs> You can edit other books, but, and it was edited by Thomas Jefferson. And basically what he did is he went all through the Bible and anything he didn't agree with, he literally edited it out. And so the Jeffersonian Bible is about this thick, literally. I don't like this, I don't like this. Now this is a Bible, and basically this is what he said. This is a Bible I can live with. Do you know that that is basically what many people do today? Well, I, I don't like that. <laughs> but we can't do that. The Bible is what the Bible is. Now, can things be taken out of context? Yes, that's why what? That's why we have many times here in this class done what? We've gone back to the original language, number one, that's first. Secondly, we put it in context. For example, one of the most, what I believe is one of the most misunderstood passages in all of the New Testament is one uh, written by the Apostle Paul, and there's a whole denomination They've got a lot of things good. Salvation, they've got really down good. But here's where they have a problem. The Apostle Paul said, let your women keep silence in the church. I would not suffer a woman to teach. How many know that if you lift those out of context, they don't mean what Paul was saying? Here's what happened. Is there anyone that has ever visited an orth even a, a modern Orthodox Jewish synagogue? Okay, so you know what I'm talking. Women sit either upstairs, 
and the men sit down or they're divided one side or the other. And in that day, women, in the Paul's day, women only went so many years to school. Okay? And I mean, they, got a, they, got, they did get an education, but only so far. So many times when things were being discussed, if you know anything about a synagogue, uh, something that they, they, they read, this, then there's a discussion. Well, the women who didn't have the education in that day would do what? They would be saying, what does that mean? Avi, Avi, what does that mean? Well, how many know if you've got 20 women screaming at their husbands, what does that mean? And then they're trying to tell them what it means. The poor person who's trying to teach from the Torah per portion or the letter or epistle that had been said can't do it. And so what Paul was, because understand, we know the context if you'll read the whole thing. And the reason was, he said, let your women keep silence in the church. Let them do what? Ask their husbands at home. Yeah. What it meant was, yeah. Now I can prove to you that that is not what Paul meant. But do they ever read the rest? No, because that says what they wanted to say. And they put a whole denomination around that. It's not what it means. For example, something very interesting when you read the New Testament. When Paul first encounters Aquila and Priscilla, it is Aquila and Priscilla. They are ministering. And as you go on, something changes. What changes? The names. The names. And pretty soon, and you're, and you're going to, actually, you're going to see it at the end of Romans, the 16th chapter of Romans. And all of a sudden, it flips to Priscilla and Aquila. And I will tell you why. It has nothing to do with the value of men over women, women over men. Why? Because the Bible tells us that we're equal. There is no male nor female as far as value in the eyes of God. But what happened is when Paul first encounters them, the ministry of Aquila is more prominent. As, you, as the ministry goes on, for some reason, Priscilla's ministry became more prominent. Not better, not more valuable in the eyes of the Lord, but it was just more prominent. And so then all of a sudden it flips and it's Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila. And when you get to the end of Romans, trust me, when we get to the 16th chapter of Romans, he said, greet Priscilla and Aquila. Now, please hear me. If women were allowed to say anything at any time in the church, that would not ever happen. He also, again, in the end of Romans says, he said, I want you to greet Phoebe and I want you to help Phoebe because she's, basically, she was a pastor. She had a church and she was a pastor. This becomes very clear when you study this. So that's not what it means. But what am I saying? Well, scriptures are taken out of, out of context. So we put them in context. But this is still, this is still our guide. This is our standard. This is what guides us. And we don't go around cutting out things or, or drawing a line through things that we don't agree with in the Word of God. We just do study to see what is actually being said there. So, and so what we see here is that it is written, speaks in the word of God. That's our authority. Now, vengeance. It says, vengeance is mine. Ek dekesis. Ek dekesis. And this word means that which proceeds from justice. Hmm. That's a little bit different than what some people think about vengeance, right? I'm going to get vengeance, and vengeance is best served cold. They least expect it. I'm going to take revenge. No. Notice this word, 
where God is saying, vengeance is mine. He's saying, this is a vengeance that proceeds from justice. Justice needs to be done. And thus, ectekesis means to give justice to someone who has been wronged, W-R-O-N-G-E-D, on the assumption that initial harm, some harm previously, was unjustified, and that retribution is called for. And in that case, retribution would be what? Justice. R-E-T-R-I-B-U-T-I-O-N. Anyone think of an example where vengeance, not vengeance is revenge that we think of, but vengeance that proceeds from justice. Any example of that that you can think of? David well, with Saul? Is that one right. of them? Yeah. And understand what he did. He warned instead. Yeah, he warned. But remember when, you know, Saul tried to kill him. And remember, Saul was sleeping in a cave. And he was supposed to have soldiers guarding him. And what did David do? He sneaked up and cut a piece off of his one. He comes down, and the next morning he gets basically probably screaming at him to wake up. And he waves it. What was he saying? I could have killed you. I could have killed you. I was close enough to cut this off. I didn't. Because what I honor God's anointed. But I could have. You've tried to kill me. I've done nothing to you to deserve being killed. And sometimes the vengeance that proceeds from justice, and I would say what happened there, because that's a real good example. Because guess what? David succeeded Saul on the throne. He didn't take it. He didn't kill Saul and take it that way. But how, what? Vengeance proceeding from justice is God. And David succeeded him on the throne. Okay, let's look. Any questions on 19? Comments on 19? Okay, verse 20, therefore, I, love, I want to just, we'll, we will, today I was working on, I think uh, I was working on uh, another therefore, but I think it's in the 13th chapter, and uh, it's un, and every time you see that, it calls for a conclusion. So therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, first of all, uh, this is kind of interesting because right away, uh, it's all in italics. Uh, so, when we look at this, we can see that in this verse, the Apostle Paul is calling on us to return good for evil. Evil. Good for evil. Um, Okay, I want to read the J.B. Phillips uh, tr translation of this. 
This is, these are God's words. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in doing, so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Um, I think our idea of heaping fire on someone's uh, head, coals of fire, um, is a little different than what uh, Paul is saying here. Let's be honest. Ooh, heap coals of fire on your head, you know, just, just put all of this burning charcoal on their head. That'll, that'll teach them. No, that's not what he refers to. We are going to get to what that means. So enemy. And it is. Uh, I think we all have enemies. If you live long, and if you, and if you don't, if you live long enough, you'll probably encounter a few. But this word in Greek is ekthros. It almost sounds like an enemy, right? Ekthros. Uh, and ekthros is one who has the extreme negative attitude that is the opposite of love. opposite of love. It's also the opposite of friendship. By the way, friends may not always agree, but that does not make them enemies, okay? There's a difference. An enemy is one that is antagonistic toward another. Always So a fader, by the way, that's us, goes beyond just non-resistance and provides active benevolence. B-E-N-E-V-O-L-E-N-C-E. -E -E. So what does that mean? That a fader, follower of Jesus goes beyond just non-resistance. Okay, I won't fight that person. And provides active benevolence. What does that mean? Because if, it, if you don't know what it means, then we need to find out what it means, right? Yeah. Try to calm it down. Yeah. yeah, but it actually means, it's just like, well, I won't fight that person. I won't run over him with my bicycle. Hang with me. So that's good enough. No. You do good for them. Now sometimes the last thing you want to do is something good for somebody who is always, always bothering you. Always wanting something. Always, right? You always bother me. You can't get sleep. You wanna, you wanna, you wanna slap them silly. Yeah. Sometimes, hang with me. Sometimes what's needed is maybe to pray, and sometimes to take your authority in the Lord and do something. For I don't know how long. We were dealing with something, with someone who lives above us. And this went on and on, and I mean night after night after night after night. I'll never forget this night. And I know I made this statement, this joy. I said, you know, we need to take our authority in the spirit. And she said, you know what? He must be very tormented. I said, you know what, I, you know, you're right. And I did. So I said, we're going to do it. And I mean, I did. I said, we have put up with this for months. No sleep. All night long. Now you may, and at that point, you know, sometimes you just get to the point, I don't care who makes fun of me. If we get, if it gets quiet and we get sleep, Hey, you, the whole floor could make fun of me if they wanted to. And I went right underneath 
where he lives. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you foul spirit, come out of him. And he was carrying God then, like that. You know what that taught me? How long are you going to put up with it till you take your authority? And I could hear my mother's voice in my ears. How many times she had said to me, you take your authority tonight. Because I'd go into some places to speak. And it was coming, it was like walking into the first church of Frigidaire. I mean, it was so cold. And, and she, this is what she'd say to me. She said, you take your authority tonight. Now, am I telling the truth? We have had quiet ever since. We could have had it three months before if, if, if I'd have, if we'd have find, if she, if find it, she said, why? Because we're ready to knock, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, knock him around and say, shut up. And I, I wish I could say I didn't say that, but I did. How would she, I bet. But I want you to see how the Lord worked. He won't let it. That was compassion. She said, he must be so tormented to do that all night long. And that touched something, and I said, oh, we're taking our authority right now. He's set free, and we can sleep. <laughs> you see, do you understand? I believe Christianity is practical, and sometimes we let the enemy push us around, and sometimes we need to take our authority, and if we take our authority, there'll be a compassion for what? For somebody who's being tormented. You see, what Jesus felt toward the demoniac, of Ged the two demoniacs of Gadara, was what? Compassion. Compassion. And then what did he do? He took his authority. And he said, all authority is given unto me, and I give you authority over how much of the and all, all, we have the right to walk in the authority. So, and actually that is uh, one way of providing active benevolence. Right? Believe me, he's way better off than he was before. <laughs> so, um, I want to um, go on. It says, the right response when you are wronged is to do right toward your enemy. How many know that's not easy? How many would be honest and say, hey, no, it's not easy? But that's the right response. We know that we can't do that in our own strength. Is there anyone here that will say, oh, why? That's just that's my, just my nature. I'm just my nature. Every time I'm wrong, I just do right toward that person. Of course not. No, it's not easy to do. Why? Because it's not in human nature. And only the Lord gives us the ability to be able to do that. So, He's saying, what, if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. And hungry is pina. And pina literally means to be in a state, and that should be of hunger, not war hunger. State of hunger. However, this word, when it is used in a figurative sense, means to long for something or strongly desire something. So it says, if this person is desiring something, strongly desiring something, then you feed, and that's so nice. And this word literally means to feed someone a small quantity of food. If they're hungry, then you give them food. And this word is in the present imperative. So it's imperative, which means what? It's not a suggestion. It is a command. So you can't wiggle out of it. It's, it's present, which means present, which means what? Ongoing, habitual. So this calls for 
this attitude and action to be our habitual practice. H-A-B-I-T-U-A-L. It's our habitual practice. It's our lifestyle. And again, I want to repeat this, and the only way we can do it is to rely on the Spirit of the Lord indwelling us. It's not something we can drum up. It's not something we can fake. It's something that can only come from falling on the strength and the ability of the Lord that he gives us. And then it then says, if he is thirsty, give him drink. Now, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. This word is dipsa. Should thirst. In other words, if he should thirst. Now, this word literally means to have a need to drink. Now, that's something to wet your, your throat, your mouth. To have dryness in the throat associated with a desire for liquids. How many have ever been really, really thirsty and your throat's dry and nothing and nothing will satisfy it until you kind of wet your throat? Now figuratively, it again means to have a strong desire for something. How many now just thirst? Remember what David said? He said, I thirst for the living God. Nothing will satisfy me but that. So it says, if your enemy thirsts, give him a drink, potise, to him, alto, to him. Now, this word literally means to give him a drink, or her, or whoever, to give a drink. Now, this is a very interesting uh, thing, and I think I want us to go over this. It says, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, I know people who get the, get the mule, that will take care of them, put fire on their head. Yeah. Now burn them, burn them on the head. That'll take. That's my, that's my, get me the right, my enemy. If you do this, they'll feel so bad, it'll be like fire on their head. It's not what it means. Um, this is figurative. Figurative, F-I-G-U-R-A-T-I-V-E. -E. Not literal language. And I'm going to explain uh, that because um, there are a couple different uh, meanings to this. And we're going to do that. So it says heap. And so rusice. So rusice. And this word means, it does mean that. It means to heap up. It means to pile on. It means to amass by setting one thing on top of another, on top of another. So it does mean heat. If you've ever built a fire, you do what? You, you do a certain way, you heat it up, and you have to bank it a certain way. Well, so the idea seems to be that of overcoming hostility, H-O-S, T I L I T Y. So you're, you're overcoming hostility against oneself by showing kindness, kindness to the hostile party. So it's a little bit differently than burning their head. Sometimes you may want to dump the whole the whole grill on top of their head. But that's not what this means. Because okay. it says it'll heat burning coals on their head. Some people get really excited about that person. <laughs> burning coals are anthracus. 
And that really does indeed mean charcoal or burning embers, pyros of fire. So it does. And thracus, pyros. But the act, this act is not something that is calculated to aggravate, but is meant to appease. A P P E A S E. And I don't think anyone would like uh, to have hot charcoal from under it. So that's obviously this means something different. And now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. Um, heaping burning coals refers to the practice of lending coals from a fire. Um, and this was very important because this was the best that one has to give another person because the fire from coals was very valuable in the ancient world. You know, we take for granted uh, gas furnaces, we take for granted gas stoves and gas ovens, electric stoves, electric ovens, electric heat. Uh, they didn't have that in the ancient world. In fact, if you, depending on how far back you go in the ancient world, uh, remember, going all the way back to Abraham, remember when God spoke to Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And remember, uh, he put the wood on, which is very interesting if you look at the typology in that whole act. Put the wood, and who carried the wood? Isaac. And he said to Abraham, he said, uh, Father, we have the wood, and we have the fire. And, he, and here's, you, had a, you had basically had fire, and you had gotten that from when lightning struck, you got, grabbed the fire. And you, you constantly kept the fire going. Why? Because that's all you had. You know, you did not just strike a match. So it was very precious. So you had the fire. When you even get into the time of the seven churches of Revelation, it was the same thing. You had, you would go and you would buy a fire box. It was fire was burning. And you took it into your own house. If that fire went out, you had to go get fire. Because otherwise you'd be eating a whole lot of cold raw meat. Now hang with me for a minute, because there are some things that then you'll understand some things. When this, when Rome was ruling in that first century, the time of the seven churches of Revelation, if your fire went out at your house, you had to go to the local place of fire that was provided for you by Rome. And before you could get another box of fire to take home, you had to declare Caesar is Lord. Caesar is God. And if you didn't, you couldn't get your fire. So you either had to have somebody to provide fire for you or you were going to eat a lot of cold stuff. So it was very, very precious. So it was, it was very valuable. And so it was considered the ultimate kindness for one neighbor to say, oh, I can give you a little bit of my fire. Here's some coals. Here's some coals from my fire. So such an act of kindness would be appreciated because it really would be kind of like killing them with kindness because they really, really need those coals of fire, okay? Now, I'm gonna give you another uh, interpretation of this. Uh, now, when you needed, let's say you needed to keep your hearth fire going, because again, that's how you cooked in your hearth. Also, it gave you warmth. Well, if you went out, you often went to a neighbor and you said, could I have some live coals of fire? How many know you're not gonna, he's not gonna put them in your hand? 
that, that, that would not be a friendly neighbor. So these he would carry on his head in a container. If you've ever watched in the Oriental world, they carry this back to their home. And so the person who would give him some live coals would be meeting his, he had a desperate need. I don't have any heat, I have no fire. And so he would heat coals on his head. Because he said, well, in other words, he was heaping. What does that mean? He's giving him a lot of them. He wasn't just giving him one little chart. Well, that don't do you. Because I really don't like you. No, he would heat. And then, if he heat them, have you ever had have you ever had a charcoal fire? And sometimes it kind of goes out real quick. Uh, if you heap a lot of them on his head, by the time he got home, at least there would be some with which he could keep the others going or relight it. He, and the one injured would be returning kindness for in, injury, because he's saying, if you're an enemy, do this. You see, the only thing a Christian is allowed to give back to the one who has injured him is what? Kindness. With the hope that the act of kindness that you do, God can then use. Hang with me, what did I say? Not you. You've done what God called you to do. You've done what God requires. It's God then that can use that to soften the heart of the person and lead him or her to repentance. And in that way, what? You would be what? Overcoming evil with good. So the thing is, that does not mean you get a chance to burn somebody. So, one act of kindness, one act of kindness may teach more about the love of God than many sermons. Many sermons. One act of kindness may teach more about the love of God than many sermons. Why? Because it's action. things that are going through your mind as we I may be beginning to see how the doctrine of the first 11 chapters are now being practical in our lives in these chapters. Um, I just want to let you know if you're watching from home remotely that the next two weeks because of our camp our camps uh, at the church we will not be having class next week or the following. So the 12th and the 19th, uh, we will not have class. We will come back uh, the 26th, yeah, 26th, on the 26th, and we'll finish up the 12th chapter and probably maybe go into the 13th chapter. So please read your Bibles in the next two weeks. Uh, but we will be looking at you. So if you're looking online, we won't be there for the next two weeks. So we will be back in two weeks. We will be looking at you actually in three weeks from tonight. We do that. Um, if, again, if you have a prayer request, if you have a comment or a question, we would love to hear from you. I would just love to hear that you are watching. And uh, please let me know. And know this. No matter what's going on in the world, our Lord, our God, is still on the throne. He's still in charge. And he's still working. He's good. 
for us and in us. Have a blessed night.